I'm Rex West, and we're going to have a look into physically based feature line rendering, where we bring line rendering into physically based rendering, opening up new avenues of creative expression for 3D artists. When an artist is drawing a line drawing, they express the shape of objects, like this bowl of fruit here, by placing lines along perceived edges and creases. Our brain is able to interpret lines as the objects they represent, and they have come to play an important role in many modern visualizations and artistic styles. In computer graphics, rather than real objects, we have data that represents 3D objects and a virtual camera. And we'd ideally like to simulate what an artist would do and automatically generate an image with plausible lines for them. There are several existing methods that explore ways to generate lines for 3D objects and they can be broken down to generally two categories, object-based and image-based. Object-based methods work directly on object geometry, like DiCarlo and colleagues' suggestive contours and Judd and colleagues' apparent ridges. These methods are capable of generating high-quality lines, but their performance scales proportional to geometric complexity, making them computationally expensive for large scenes. On the other hand, image-based methods process an input image or screen buffer and produce an output line rendering, like here in Saito and Takahashi's comprehensible rendering where they compute derivatives on image buffers. And Lee and colleagues lines via abstracted shading where they process a fully shaded render to produce a line rendering. The render quality of these methods is limited by the resolution of the input images but as they scale with resolution and not geometric complexity, they're very fast for large scenes. However, there are several methods based on raycasting that get the best of both worlds. They operate in image space, so they scale proportional to the pixel resolution, but they use raycasting to efficiently and accurately query information about the geometry, so they can achieve very high quality lines with relatively low cost. As we build upon existing ray-based methods, let's take a bit deeper dive into how they work. Chaudhry and Parker introduced the first ray-based line rendering method. When computing if a line passes through a pixel, we could potentially try to directly intersect them with a ray. However, many of the edges and discontinuities we'd like to draw lines for are infinitesimally thin and can't be directly intersected. Instead, Chaudhry and Parker proposed to take a region of the image around a center ray and project it into 3D space. For this region, they generate a stencil of additional sample rays and compare the center ray to the sample rays using a heuristic that, if satisfied, gives us a good guess that there is a line that passes through the region. For example, we can compare properties such as depth from the camera, surface normal, object ID, or even a combination thereof. And if those properties are different enough, we probably crossed a line. Their method has some drawbacks though. It's limited to directly visible surfaces and due to its fixed stencil of rays, it's prone to aliasing. Ogaki and Georgiev extend the work of Chowdhury and Parker to include lines seen through specular reflections and refractions. And they also showed that randomly drawn ray samples can be used instead of a stencil to reduce aliasing artifacts. Here, we see that their extension does a good job of capturing the lines of objects reflected by the specular sphere. However, there's a bit of an issue. The line test is performed in image space. This works well for rays traveling in a similar direction, like those used for directly visible and specular objects. However, for glossy objects, like the floor, the reflected rays can potentially be scattered in many different directions. Intuitively, we'd expect lines seen in a glossy reflection to be blurry, but the image space line test ends up trying to detect hard lines on blurry data, resulting in strong artifacts. However, there is a field of graphics very well suited to these types of effects, called physically based rendering, and if we can integrate feature lines into it, 
we can take advantage of its ability to render these effects naturally. In physically based rendering, we want to generate an image by simulating how much light leaves light sources, bounces around a scene, and reaches a virtual camera. One effective method for doing so is path tracing. In path tracing, we start at the camera and progressively shoot rays until some termination condition is met, like hitting a light source. This process creates one possible path that light could have traveled, and for each path we can compute how much light it carries and its contribution to the final image. As we sample more paths, we get a better idea of how much light bounces through the scene. This process simulates physical effects like glossy reflections well, so let's see how we can use this to our advantage to implement physically-based feature line rendering. Our goal is then to model lines in a physical enough way to fit into physically-based rendering, while still preserving the look and feel of existing methods. We've found that we can model lines as an intersectable light source, where the line test is the intersection test, and the light they emit is the color of the line. The image space line test used by existing methods has difficulty when the scattered rays of glossy reflections are considered. We push the image space line test into object space, which acts as an intersection test for lines. We can then test each edge of a path, and when we find a line, we can treat it as a light source emitting the color of the line and place a light vertex at the intersection point. We can then compute the light it carries and accumulate like normal. Let's look at one possible way to implement this in practice. We start out with a path sampled by an ordinary off-the-shelf path tracer. We then, starting from the camera, test each edge of the path for a line intersection. If an intersection isn't found, we continue to the next edge until we find a line. We then modify the path to include a new light vertex that emits the color of the line at the point of intersection and remove any extra vertices. For the modified path, we can now recompute how much light it carries and accumulate. This process results in ordinary paths that easily integrate into modern renderers and they open up line rendering to a wide variety of new effects. However, testing for a line intersection at every edge of a path can result in a shading-like effect on rough surfaces, like on this diffuse cube here. This can be undesirable for some styles, so we can programmatically choose which materials reflect feature lines, for example, just the specular sphere and the glossy floor. We can even limit the line test to just directly visible surfaces and specular reflections, recreating the look and feel of Ogaki and Georgiev. And, similar to existing methods, we can freely adjust the line width and color. For a much more detailed explanation, various implementation choices, a few performance optimizations, please see the paper. So how does this all work out in practice? Here we have a simple scene that has specular reflections and refractions in the glass and a checkerboard pattern in the background. The method of Chowdhury and Parker produces plausible lines for directly visible surfaces, but it lacks the refractions in the orange inset and shows some aliasing on the checkerboard pattern in the blue inset. The method of Ogaki and Georgiev overcomes these issues and, zooming in, we see that they produce plausible lines for the refraction through the glass and their randomized sample rays reduce aliasing on the checkerboard. In our method, we see a shading-like effect as a result of testing for feature lines at every edge of a path. As this can be undesirable, we can programmatically restrict feature line detection to only certain path types, for example, as a comparison, to just those paths supported by the method of Ogaki and Georgiev. If we zoom in, we see that the resulting renders are nearly identical and have comparable performance. This scene here is a bit more challenging for existing methods with glossy reflections and depth of field.
when rendering lines for this scene, the method of Chowdhury and Parker lacks the reflection in the floor, but results in fairly convincing depth of field, seen in the blue inset. The method of Ogaki and Georgiev, on the other hand, due to its image space line test, results in strong artifacts for the glossy reflection and regions that are out of focus. Here, We've limited line testing of our method to paths supported by Ogaki and Georgiev, as well as reflections seen in the glossy floor. As our method leverages physically based rendering, it's able to naturally generate plausible lines for both the glossy reflections and the depth of field. Let's now look at some examples that combine lines with shading and are a bit closer to what we might find in production. Here we've combined together line rendering with full shading. And as we increase the intensity of physical effects, like the depth of field and the spectral dispersion of the prism at the bottom, the lines naturally follow. This lets artists focus on the design of the visuals without having to worry about compositing order or fine-tuning parameters. As a final result, we'll take a quick look at the design choices used in creating the Battle Strider scene and how each affects the rendered image. Starting with path tracing, we have something like this. We then add some default black lines, but they're a bit heavy, especially on the orange battle strider. So we adjust the line width and color to lighten up their presence. We also see that the shading effect, caused by the dense lines around the armaments, result in them looking a bit dull. So we flag their material to not reflect lines, bringing back a nice metallic sheen. Satisfied with the line settings, we then enable a physical lens model for a depth of field effect that guides the viewer's gaze to the center. And lastly, we enable per wavelength refractive indices for a light chromatic aberration effect, giving us our final image. Let's recap with a quick summary and then close with some potential future work. We introduced physically-based feature line rendering that brings ray-based feature line rendering into physically-based rendering by modeling feature lines as light sources and produces ordinary paths that easily integrate into path-based renderers. This opens up new avenues of creative expression for artists, adding support for effects like glossy reflections, depth of field, and spectral dispersion. But this is just a first step. Our proposed method treats feature lines as light sources that absorb all incoming light. This maintains the look and feel of existing line rendering methods, but lacks the ability to render lines that reflect or transmit light. A more comprehensive material model for feature lines would provide even further means for creative expression. Using path tracing as the underlying path sampler makes the implementation straightforward. But it can be inefficient for scenes with complex lighting and occlusion. Adding support for additional path sampling techniques, like bidirectional path tracing, would help improve robustness. Bringing feature lines into physically based rendering is really just a first step. If we can integrate additional stylized effects, for example, cell shading, into physically based rendering, we open up the possibility of a unified framework for generating creative content. For more info, check out our project page. Thanks for watching.